Victoria County, Texas, May 30th, 1923, an American ornithologist has heard rumors of a massive nesting site, and he intends to find it. As he journeys deeper and deeper through the Guadalupe River Valley, he sees a flash of white flying overhead, a sign that his objective is near. At last, he finds what he's looking for, a nesting colony of the American white ibis. We soon came to the main nesting grounds of the white ibises. The place seemed alive with them. The air was full of white ibises, flying about in all directions. Every tree and bush was as full of their nests as possible. Those were the words of ornithologist Arthur Cleveland Bent, who wrote everything he observed that day in this book. There's a ton of information in here about the American white ibis. But I have a personal interest in this bird because, well, it was the first wildlife I ever filmed. Badly. Anyway, the things that fascinated Arthur Cleveland Bent 100 years ago are the same things that fascinated me. I want to see what he saw that day, feel what he felt, and that's what I'm going to do. Together, we will find an ibis nesting colony, and along the way, learn everything we can about this species, where it comes from, how it lives, how it loves, and how it adapts to an ever-changing world. We will journey across inland swamps, over country roads and coastal waterways to find what we're after. And maybe we'll also discover a little bit about ourselves. So what are we waiting for? Let's go find our animal of Texas. Finding a nesting colony is not as simple as you might think. Unlike many colonial nesting birds, the white ibis doesn't nest in the same place every year, so it's not like you can predict where they'll be. But they are social creatures, and as such, they can be found nesting at the same sites as other species. So here's the plan. I'll be driving to four known rookery sites nearby, in hopes of finding a nesting colony of the American white ibis. And on the way, we're going to answer some interesting questions about this bird, like, where does this species sit on the tree of life? The American white ibis is one of 32 species in the family Threskdornithidae, which includes ibises and spoonbills. The traditional view is that these two can be separated into monophyletic subfamilies, which would mean that all ibises are more closely related to each other than to any spoonbill, and vice versa. But mounting genetic evidence is painting a different picture. A 2013 molecular study found that spoonbills are actually a type of ibis. Let me explain. According to the study, there are two monophyletic groupings in the ibis spoonbill family, the endemic New World clade and the widespread clade, both being named based on historical biogeography. Zoom in and we see that the spoonbills are nested comfortably within the widespread clade, along with the African sacred ibis. Interestingly, millions of African sacred ibises were mummified in ancient Egypt as veneration to the god Thoth, who of course had the head of an ibis. Why did I bring up ibis mummies? Because it's interesting, and we like history here at Evans Wildlife. Also, I wrote a whole segment about this topic and it got cut from the final script. And I bought this Thoth figurine. So we're talking about it. Anyway, the American white ibis is placed in the New World clade, and it is congeneric with the scarlet ibis meaning that they are in the same genus, Eudochimus. And they are so similar that some researchers place them in the same species. Scarlet and white ibises living together in Venezuela have foraging and mating behaviors that are pretty much indistinguishable. And adorable pink hybrid birds, I call them hybrises, are quite common here. Unfortunately for the same species camp, the most recent genetic studies place these birds firmly into separate species, Either way, they do have very different geographic ranges, with the scarlet ibis confined to the northern coast of South America and the white ibis being found much more broadly 
from Venezuela to South Carolina. And smack dab in between is Texas. 30 miles outside of Houston is Brazos Bend State Park, a swampy landscape famous for an abundance of alligators and a variety of wetland birds. The American white ibis can also be seen here, foraging for food and hopefully gathered in a nesting colony. This is probably one of my favorite places to film wildlife. I've been here a lot the past few years and I think the reason is it feels so untouched. There's something instinctual about wanting to be out in nature. I think this is a great place to do that. Usually the ibises nest in a set of trees next to the trail, but I see nothing there. So I go to look elsewhere. There are signs of ibises on the trail, so I climb up to get a better look. You see those white specks way over there? I think that's where the ibises are nesting this year. And unfortunately to get there, we're gonna have to get a little wet. I decide not to become gator food. But what kind of food do white ibises like to eat? And how do they catch it? Like the humans of Southeast Texas, the American white ibis mostly eats crawfish. Most predators use their eyes to hunt, allowing them to pursue their prey even after they've been spotted. This pursuit hunting is pretty much non-existent in the white ibis, which instead uses its long, sensitive bill to feel around in the muddy, shallow water. This feeding strategy mostly limits the bird to slow-moving prey that cannot escape once being prodded. But there are some exceptions. Ornithologist and white ibis fan James Cushlin observed that when fish densities are exceptionally high, ibises switch to eating mostly fish. Even though these fish are speedy, the tightly packed nature of the schooling prey makes them more catchable by that narrow bill. The tip of this bill has sensory pits called herbscorp this bill tip organ allows the ibis to detect changes in pressure. So as it probes its beak into water or sediment, it is able to remotely detect small invertebrates and fish, and able to assess whether fish density is high enough to switch to that more calorically dense food source. This probing technique is the primary foraging behavior of the white ibis, but there are other ways that this bird hunts. One such technique is head swinging which is actually the primary foraging behavior of spoonbills. Remember, spoonbills are actually a type of ibis. If bill shape and foraging behavior are linked in some way, then it's likely that the spoonbills evolved from a branch of ibises that began to specialize in the foraging behavior of head swinging, which is more effective with a flatter bill. So that's the origin of spoonbills, but where did ibises come from in the first place? 50 million years ago in the Middle Eocene, Northern Europe was a very different place. Messel, Germany, for example, was a tropical wetland, perfect for a certain wading bird. Meet Rhynchiotes mesolensis, an ibis-like bird with more than 12 relatively complete fossils found in Messel, dated to 48 million years ago. You might be wondering why I use the phrase ibis-like bird, rather than simply calling Rhynchiotes an early ibis. According to one recent study, there are major differences between today's ibises and Rhynchiotes. For one, Rhynchiotes does not have a fused upper palate. How random and oddly specific. But in fact, all of the rescue today possess such a palate. Additionally, Rhynchiotes lacks the pitted bill tip organ associated with modern ibises, suggesting that this species did not use the exact same feeding strategy seen today. Ancestor or not, in a recent genetic analysis of countless bird species, we see that Threskeornithidae split off from the herons and egrets roughly 60 million years ago, aligning somewhat to the dating of Rhynchiotes mesolensis. Speaking of dating, I'm late for a date with the next possible nesting site. I approach the next destination with a sense of optimism, because I've heard great things about the place. Vesoft County Park in Alvin, Texas. Home of joggers, screaming children, demonic geese, and lots and lots of roosting birds. This park is new to me, so I hope to see something I haven't seen before. And that would turn out to be the case.
these little tree islands are havens for herons and egrets, but not so much for the American white ibis. Despite my best effort searching, I don't see a single one. Guess it's time to move on. Still cautiously optimistic, I leave the park and start my drive over to the Bolivar Peninsula, my second to last chance to find a nesting colony before dark. This coastal part of Texas is the perfect place to find some wetland birds. After a long car ride, it's just a ferry away. So let's learn some more about this species. As we've discussed, white ibises rely on slow-moving, more catchable prey, and they are also able to sample foraging patches with their remote sensing bill tip organ to assess prey type and prey density. But doing this takes energy, and saving energy while foraging is critical for survival and reproduction. Therefore, we should expect that various traits and behaviors would have evolved in the white ibis that allow it to make efficient and effective choices on which patches to forage. And that does seem to be the case. For example, white ibises have evolved to be social. If they see another ibis feeding in an area, they don't have to waste their time sampling foraging patches. They can simply join in with the other ibises. This can also explain the white plumage, which is easy to spot down below if you're an ibis in flight. So ingrained is this flock-based foraging behavior that they often settle down to forage next to other white feathered birds, such as great egrets. The social nature of the American white ibis speaks to an important theme in evolution. It's not always about who's stronger or who's tougher. Sometimes it's about looking after one another, making allies, and leaning on your friends when you need help. The Smith Oak Sanctuary is well known for its massive rookery and the excellent viewing angles of said rookery. Colonial birds from all over Texas come here to build nests, lay eggs, and raise their young in a safe environment. I can hear countless birds beyond the trees, hundreds, no, thousands. That's a lot of birds. As I search through the trees, I find that out of thousands of feathered creatures, there's not a single ibis in view. Our search for a nesting colony is not looking so great, but I'm not ready to leave just yet. I can't help but think that this feeling of awe and wonder is similar to what Arthur Cleveland Bent experienced 100 years ago, seeing thousands of white feathered birds looking after their young, bonding with one another, just trying their best to survive. One of the most important factors in understanding the American white ibis and why it is so difficult to find a nesting colony is that their foraging habitat is not predictable from year to year. Shallow wetlands by their very nature tend to dry up quickly or get flooded out. And this unpredictability of foraging habitat has forced the white ibis to evolve a nomadic lifestyle. When the environment around a nesting site changes for the worse, they have to move on to someplace else a place which, so far, I have failed to locate. But I still have one last shot before nightfall. As the sun gets lower in the sky, I speed down the highway to my final destination, my last hope to find a nesting colony of the American white ibis. My mind starts to race. Has this all been a waste of time? Has this bird gotten the best of me? Have I lost this fight? Until at last, I arrive. I hear the 
the sound of many birds. But when I see them from afar, I can't tell what they are. So I press on. Then I see it. Black-tipped wings flapping. A flurry of orange and white. Is this what I've spent all day searching for? Well, we found it, y'all. We found the nesting colony. Oh my god. If there's one thing I've learned from the American white ibis, it's to be flexible. Life doesn't always go according to plan, and when the world changes around you, when you see the environment shifting, sometimes you just have to adapt. In a sense, the story of this nomadic species is the same as that of the entirety of life on Earth, a story of change. Geographical change, evolutionary change, and the changes to this planet to which organisms must adapt or perish. Now we are able to understand this story of change more than ever before. And it's been my pleasure to share that story with you here on Evans Wildlife. See y'all next time.